Well, hello, my name is Kirti Matura. I'm a horticulturist and also a program coordinator for a Smartscape landscape training program with the Maricopa County Cooperative Extension in Phoenix. Today, I'd like to talk a little bit about some edibles. I am a great um, consumer of plant products, and I just think it's so fun to, um, you know, incorporate different edible plants into the landscape. Now, when we think of edible landscape, a lot of people think of what might be a little bit more traditional, including edible vegetables and um, fruit trees, the more traditional types of edibles within your landscape. But I want to encourage you to use a lot of our actual desert adapted drought tolerant plants that would just be a part of a really good desert landscape. So I'm going to start out with a few trees and kind of work through different plant types to give you an idea of some things out there. I do want to say every one of us has a different system and so do a little bit of investigating before you start to um, partake in some of these edibles. Um, most of them are you know totally fine for anybody to eat but we all have different allergies and so forth food wise so um, do a little bit of investigation if you haven't already tried something. So first off, we have our desert hackberry. This is a great kind of small tree or large shrub type plant that can be pretty gnarly. It has a typical desert growth pattern of just growing full to the ground. It can be, however, gradually pruned as it grows and develops if you'd like a little bit of clear understory. When left growing full to the ground, also a wonderful wildlife habitat for shelter. So this shrub, it's, it's very densely branching. The flowers are minute. Um, you can see my finger there uh, behind a cluster of tiny cream flowers. They're really inconspicuous, but once pollinated, the fruits that develop are quite noticeable. They're about pea size, bright orange in color, and they're pretty tasty. To me, it's kind of um, like um, nibbling on a rose hip, maybe a little bit more flavor than that, but a similar flavor. And you will definitely get um, at least one good harvest from your desert hackberry each year, sometimes even two harvests. Of course, when we have any fruit like this, the birds are gonna be watching. So make sure that you keep an eye on things on the fruits as they're ripening so you can um, get a share of the harvest with those fruit eating birds. The desert willow tree that so many of us enjoy just for its simple beauty with those fabulous flowers during the summer months and the hummingbirds that it also draws. This is a tree that has flowers that can be harvested, dried, and you can make a tea. I do want to point out, this is a great example. With the desert willow flowers, you should not be using the flowers for tea if you're pregnant. Word of caution there. But it has a, a mild kind of minty um, flavor to it. Makes a nice tea for the winter especially. And again, this is one of our, you know, just fabulous desert adapted plants that we see so often. So we can be utilizing these plants not just for their beauty, but also for our consumption as well. The ironwood tree. Now this is about as drought tolerant as you can get. Just a wonderful signature plant of our desert region here. The growth is a little bit slow, but it's so worth it. When you have one of these incorporated in your landscape in the spring, late spring, uh, most often later than the other spring bloomers, around May, you'll have these fabulous flowers that are kind of a combination of rosy lavender, pink, and cream color. Once those flowers are pollinated, seed pods start to develop, and within those pods, you will have a dark brown seed that ripens. Those seeds can be harvested. You can actually harvest them when they're still a little soft in that pod and just nibble on them, eat them raw. Once they're fully dried, you might need to um, maybe roast them and grind them a little bit. I love them because they have a peanut-like flavor. So yay, peanuts. Um, it's a wonderful treat, I think. And again, once they drop to the ground when you're working with plants like this, with seeds like this, it 
can be unsafe. So it's best to harvest them directly off the tree before they get to the point where they would drop off. The birds also, um, birds and other wildlife will partake of those when they're fallen to the ground. We have um, two native Palo Verde trees and here comes into play, you know, we all have different taste buds. The blue Palo Verde has edible um, young pods, but I find them a little bit bitter. My favorite is our native little leaf Palo Verde. This Palo Verde it stays a little bit smaller, so it's more suitable perhaps for a smaller landscape situation. We have this fabulous spring bloom. After pollination, the seed pods start to develop. And you can eat the pods when they're super young and you know just nibble on them fresh. Or you can wait until you can start to see that actual seed inside the pod develop and you'll see those constrictions around the seeds. You need to harvest while it's still green if you want to enjoy them, similarly to an edamame. If they fully mature, they'll turn, the seed pod will turn kind of a cream color. You could um, grind those seeds and use them for a flower, but I like to just boil the green seed pods to prepare edamame and eat them in that same fashion. Our friend, she gets kind of gourmet adding this and that to them. I just go straight up. Um, just the seed pods in water with a little tiny bit of sea salt, perhaps. Um, but she also will prepare the um, flowers. She'll harvest those and then kind of, I guess like a stir fry, um, tiny bit of oil and some seasonings and make a, a popcorn-like um, snack, which can be fun to share with friends. A lot of people are aware that the mesquite tree offers pods that can be very tasty. We have so many different species of mesquite. They would all have different flavors. Even within one particular species, such as our native velvet mesquite, individual trees could have slightly different flavors. Some might be a little sweeter, others maybe not as flavorful. So before you spend a lot of time harvesting, be sure to do a taste test is my recommendation. You can eat the pod that surrounds the seeds, which I think is what a lot of us do. You can get uh, an old blender from a garage sale and um, grind it to make flour in that fashion. Um, or you can just steep those pods to make a, a delightful tea-like beverage. You can use them in, in different ways. Um, now for marketable flour, people use mills and it takes a special mill that will grind the pod and the seed, um, which is very nutritious with proteins. Um, but I think most of us, if we're just doing this at home, you use an old blender, not a good one because it could mess up the blade, and you've got the, um, that fiber of the pod surrounding the seed that you can utilize. The sumacs, there are different species of sumac in our region and surrounding areas and they offer some very, very tasty fruits. The fruits, once um, the plant flowers and the fruits are produced, you can harvest those, you can nibble on them fresh, you could dry them um, to use later, um, but you can crush them and extract the liquid from them to make roost juice. It is sweet and tart. I think this is the con this kind of created the concept of the candy sweet tarts that we some of us enjoy, um, but those fruits can be quite tasty. So our desert sumac, which is a smaller shrub, uh, and different species offer some I think very interesting and tasty fruits. Um, some people call one from a little bit higher elevation um, lemonade berry, in fact, because of the wonderful. Um, juice that can be derived. Now, we have from the Mediterranean region, the vitex tree. Some people call it monk's pepper tree, chase tree. The flowers, kind of late spring is when they'll occur mid to late spring. Flowers could be most commonly purple or white or a delicate pink. Um, doesn't matter which color. Um, they are a great attractant for butterflies. Once pollinated, those very small flowers will develop into seeds that are about the size of peppercorns. They have a spicy flavor like a peppercorn also. So monks used to use 
those seeds as a seasoning in their food. And these can just be beautiful. You typically have a, um, you know, several bloom spurts through the summer months that are just lovely fragrant and will attract a lot of different butterflies to your landscape to enjoy as well. Our desert fan palm, which is native way over to the western edge of Arizona, is a tree that I think most people just think of as something I think too often to abuse with over pruning, but they just think of it as so many other plants as just an, you know, a tree to use in a landscape. The fruits, they, this is not directly related to the date palm, but if you wanted to harvest these very tiny kind of purplish, bluish, blackish seeds, you can harvest those and they have a flavor. The pulp um, surrounding the seed is a little bit similar to a, a date fruit. The pulp surrounding each seed isn't very much, but I think they're, they're kind of tasty. And also if you're partaking in these as edibles, that might reduce the little sprouts that tend to come up. Graythorn. This is a great tree. If you want something for security, it's pretty gnarly. The little branchlets end in a very sharp point. Um, it's very much thorn-like. And if you've got one of these, you let it grow full to the ground. Nobody's gonna try to you know, get through that to your, your house, you know, a window or, or anything. So it can be a great security plant. Also provides edibles for people and those wonderful fruit-eating birds and other wildlife. This is a little bit similar to the palm that we just saw, where the majority of that fruit is taken up by seed, but the pulp surrounding it has a, a nice flavor. Similar to some of these others we've seen, the flowers are teeny tiny, but the fruit you will notice when it's ripened. And you can even see there's an example of a fruit that the birds have started enjoying there. Looking at a few shrubs now, this is a native, a little bit higher elevation, but it does fabulously here in the valley in full sun exposure. It's super drought tolerant, um, just a wonderful shrub that offers an oregano-like flavor through those leaves. The leaves are pretty small, but they can be used same fashion as you would one of the true oreganos from the Mediterranean region. Also, this is another great one for the butterflies. The chiltepine. If you like chili peppers, I would suggest tracking down a chiltepine to include in your garden. These are native to southeastern Arizona. They are super, you know, drought tolerant compared to our other um, cultivated chili varieties. They can take more sun, they can take a little bit more cold also. So overall, they're just tougher than a lot of those cultivars that we also enjoy. The fruits are very tiny, they are very hot, and I will warn you, get your harvest because there could be a mockingbird just waiting for those fruits to ripen and they just gobble those fruits down um, whole. They don't detect the heat like we do. This is a lovely, very delicate looking um, spring bloomer that out in the wild on our hillsides in the desert might not appear some years if we don't get good winter rains to initiate the sprouting of the leaves from this corm underground. Good rain years, this can be just seen on hillsides with these very delicate, rosy lavender flowers. So we can eat the flowers. Historically, the corn was eaten also. I doubt if we get some of these growing in our yard that we'd wanna dig up the corn and eat corn and eat it, but it is edible, definitely. It has an onion-like flavor. The Mormon teas, several different species are found in Arizona. We have two mainly that are available in our landscape industry here in our area. Mormon teas need to be planted in full sun. So they have this just real vigorous stem growth and development with the stems being um, numerous and also upright. Full sun is best. They are super drought tolerant and you can harvest stems and use them to make a tea. These that are native in our region, they're not like the Chinese ephedra that can cause cardiac problems and so forth. Um, these are more friendly in that respect. The desert lavender, when the foliage is gently caressed, has a lavender-like scent that I just find so delightful. Now, lavenders, like oreganos, are native to the Mediterranean region. This is native right here 
in our surrounding areas of the valley. Super drought tolerant, loves sun. It could take a little bit of shade, but best in full sun. Now those leaves that offer that wonderful fragrance when gently caressed also can be dried and used to make a tea that has kind of a minty sage flavor. And the flowers that develop on the desert lavender, um, they're very tiny, but they're so delicate and lovely. And they'll attract butterflies, hummingbirds, pollinator bees, all those great visitors to your garden. The chuparosa is one of my favorites. Those flowers appear from usually around October or November right through March, April, sometimes even into May. Several months of these tubular flowers that attract hummingbirds. You can harvest some of these flowers for yourself, sprinkle them into salads, and enjoy their mild cucumber flavor with a little bit of sweetness from the nectar, of course. These can be found in more typically the red flowering form, but some nurseries will grow the yellow blooming as well. Um, here's another oregano flavor for those of you who love oreganos. I'd say this is my favorite. The Mexican oregano gets to be a very good sized shrub with really spicy flavor to those leaves. And during the summer months, you have these flowers that have a delightful sweet honey scent to them. The thornberries or wolfberries, we have a few different species that are wonderful in our landscapes. The flowers are quite small, delicate. They attract butterflies and hummingbirds. Once pollinated, these little fruits develop that can be very, very tasty. And it's another one, you need to keep an eye on the birds because they're keeping an eye on the fruit if you want to get a good harvest. This is a large shrub, so you need to make sure that you need, leave sufficient room in your landscape. So we've got two species primarily that really give us kind of year-round foliage as well as these delightful fruits that you might get um, two harvests or so a year. Now, the barberries, they are fabulous. In the spring, the flowers look like miniature daffodils, followed by fruits that are so juicy, so flavorful. And these, um, we have a couple species, um, this red barberry and um, its relative also. Both of these, um, you can grow them. They are, the foliage is a little reminiscent of holly if you've grown that in your landscape elsewhere. Um, but these fruits that develop around, oh, early to midsummer are just so juicy, so flavorful. Rosemary mint, the flowers and the leaves can be harvested for kind of an oregano, minty um, flavor. I don't know where the rosemary part comes in, but maybe my taste buds taste oregano, others taste rosemary. Um, just delightful. So you can harvest these flowers too, sprinkle them in salads, and you can use the foliage like you would any other oregano or rosemary condiment. Rosemaries are fabulous. You can use any of the rosemaries that you see. Um, you just, I would caution you, don't pick them from roadside where there's a lot of motor um, pollution, but any that you would get in a nursery, um, they all have slightly different flavors. And we have the upright forms that can get quite large, as well as the mounding or trailing forms, which can be so delightful in the landscape. You can even nibble on the flowers of your rosemary. And jojobas, these are fabulous kind of backdrop large shrubs with their silvery foliage. They have separate male and female plants. So once a female plant has the flower pollinated, you get these seeds that develop. Um, some of you might have used lotions or creams or something that had jojoba oil in them. It's actually a liquid wax that is extruded from these seeds, but the seeds to me have kind of a hazelnut flavor with a slight bitter aftertaste. Um, when eaten raw, I'm lazy, so I've never roasted them historically people roasted them, ground the seed, and made a coffee-like beverage. So, and you're not gonna get much of a harvest if you keep shearing the shrubs down to nothing. Some perennials, lavenders. Basically any lavender, um, the flowers can be used in baking and making lemonades and so forth, all with a slightly different flavor. They just need excellent drainage though. During monsoon season, if you don't have sufficient drainage, overnight seemingly, they'll just turn to a crisp. So this one it loves sun and demands excellent drainage. Now from a little bit east of us, the Chihuahuan Desert, the autumn sage um, is used quite a bit in landscapes around here. Not many people are aware that you can harvest those leaves and use them as a condiment like you would 
sage, rosemary, oregano, and these are available in different bloom colors. So just pick what you prefer color-wise and the hummingbirds will visit the flowers. You can harvest your leaves. The Mexican mint marigold is a delight. Um, in October, the flowers just burst open, beautiful golden color. The leaves and the flowers can be harvested and dried and they have a licorice-like or anise-like flavor. The plant will die down, die back to the ground, typically during winter. Just be aware of that. Don't freak out and declare it dead. It will re-sprout the next spring. Similar to garlic, flavor-wise, is the society garlic. Um, now this plant, though, instead of using digging this up, you're just going to eat the leaves and the flowers. They have a mild garlic flavor. They can go in full sun. And there is just the plain green foliage available as well as a variegated foliage form that is also lovely in the garden. And you'll get um, kind of spring into the summer bloom with the society garlics. You might include some edible wildflowers that um, will grace your garden with beautiful blooms in the spring, such as this lemon mint. The flowers will start opening usually April and continue through May with these delightful whorls of um, kind of rosy lavender flowers. The leaves and the flowers have kind of a minty flavor to them. You can make tea. Now, chia, this has become quite a rage. Um, you know, decades ago, not many people in our region were thinking of it as an edible. This is another spring bloomer. This is our native chia, the desert chia. The plant isn't very big and vigorous. The flowers are quite tiny, but if you sprinkle enough seed in your garden around November, you'll get a good harvest. Um, those little whorls that were the flowers, um, that's what you're gonna shake the seed out of. And chia is beneficial in so many different ways. Um, there are passion vines. This is probably the one that you'll get the best fruit harvest from in our region. Others that produce big fruits um, don't seem to produce very well here in our really arid, hot condition. But this one produces fruits, oh, maybe about a quarter size diameter. I call them the one squirt fruit. The um, fruits are, they taste just like the commercial passion fruits. The grapes, you can grow traditional grapes, but also there are some that are more native to our region. Um, there's a native grape as well as this really wonderful Rogers Red that in the fall, before the leaves drop, you have the most dramatic, brilliant red color change to the foliage. And there are so many succulents we can enjoy in our landscapes. Talk about low maintenance. Something like a saguaro, after that April bloom, around late June or July, you will have fruits. Now, you'll need uh, equipment to get the fruit knocked down, but it's worth the effort. These fruits are just so juicy. The pulp, the seeds nutritious also. And um, here's an example. Some friends made a saguaro fruit sorbet. It's another one you've got to keep an eye because the birds really know when these are ripe. A lot of us have this Peruvian apple cactus as a landscape plant. That fruit's very edible, and good summers, you can get a couple dozen blooms on the plant in one night, which are just, you know, enchanting. Um, but then when you have pollination, you'll have numerous fruits to enjoy from that cactus. Now, you might be familiar with choyas. That is a plant where typically it's the flower bud that is harvested. So you harvest the bud before the flower even opens. You can boil that or roast it. They're very nutritious. I think they have kind of like a light peppery flavor to them. A lot of our smaller cacti, um, the hedgehogs produce luscious fruit. They might be a little prickly, but you can scrape the spines off and get to that delightful pulp to enjoy. Um, but there is one barrel cactus that um, you don't even have to battle any spines. This one doesn't have any spines on the fruit, has this delightful juicy pulp inside. This is our native barrel. Now it doesn't have the pulp, but the seeds, which are pretty large, inside of those fruits is very edible. And that seed, I mean the, the fruit coating, you can you know kind of slice that and maybe stir fry it and enjoy that, but you won't have that real juicy fruit.
Here is a vining cactus. You can um, maybe find different types of these vining cacti to include in your garden. And those fruits are quite tasty as well. Um, even our red yuccas that we see everywhere can nibble on those flowers. They have a mild corn flavor, so good to add to salads in the summer. Um, real small pincushion cactus, tiny little fruits, but they are delicious. And this from Mexico, this whortleberry or garambuyo, the flowers smell like jasmine. They fill the air in the morning and it, it, it travels. That scent is just delightful. When you get pollination, those fruits are about pea size and their flavors cross between a grape and a blueberry. You can see some sorbet has been made out of that fruit. So all these cactus fruits are very popular down in Mexico especially. Our prickly pears, we can eat the pads. You wanna look for the young pads that are developing so that you, they don't have that fibrous um, inner portion to them that develops later. This is our native prickly pear um, that we see in so many areas of the desert. The Engelmann's prickly pear has these beautiful yellow flowers kind of late spring, and often they produce abundant fruits that are fairly large, really juicy, very flavorful. Here you can see this is in a market. They'll scrape those spines off the pads and have them available for people to buy ready, ready to prepare. There's so many ways you can utilize what they call the, the nopalitos, the pads from the prickly pear, and they're so nutritious. And here you can see some of the fruits of different prickly pears um, sliced open. And if you're afraid of those spines, there is the Indian fig prickly pear that really doesn't have spines, maybe some tiny minute glockids, but it's definitely more friendly if you'd like to have one of those in your landscape. You can also enjoy the fruits of those. Now, looking like a dead stick most of the year, our native queen of the night cactus it has the most exquisite, enchanting fragrance when these flowers bloom at night, um, typically around early July. This is a plant that needs some shade. And once flowers are pollinated, these elongated fruits develop. And again, they are so delicious. But the birds will definitely be, be watching. Um, that upper left example, you can actually see right through that fruit pod because the birds have totally cleaned out all the pulp from inside. Elephant's food, who knew? Not just for elephants can be a food for us. You can harvest those leaves. They have kind of a um, tangy, um, almost kind of citrusy flavor to them and juiciness. Of course, you can sprinkle a few of these leaves in your salad. Oregon pipe cactus. Yes, those fruits are really spiky. They're about golf ball size, but they, I've heard, are delicious. This is one I just keep missing the fruits every year and have never had an opportunity to taste. Yuccas. There are different yuccas that we use in our landscape. Some are low growing and some are more tree-like forms. Either way, you can harvest the flowers, which usually occur maybe mid-late spring or early summer, depending on the type of the yucca. And you can utilize those petals. You can um, pull the petals off the flower and sprinkle those in salads. Um, I know some people who um, will lightly dip them maybe in egg, egg white, and make flower fritters. Um, so you can utilize those in different ways. This particular one, called the banana yucca, will develop a pulpy fruit that is banana-like. Um, it's probably best if you cook it to prepare it for eating, but when they're really nice and ripe, they could be eaten in the raw state. Tree form yuccas are difficult to harvest. On the right, you see a younger plant. It is getting starting to develop a tree form, but this particular yucca, once it really takes off, it will be quite tall, and then the bloom stalk extends even higher um, so might be a little more difficult to harvest the flowers to enjoy um, but certainly when they're young you can reach those flowers i really encourage you to um, be adventurous and try some of these edibles from our landscape plants there are many many more 
that you can investigate, I would encourage you to go to the Arizona Municipal Water Users Association website and check out their um, wonderful landscape plants for the Arizona desert um, online form. It has a search function. Unfortunately, you can't search for edibles specifically, but you can filter out and, and find plants that are the perfect fit for your yard. So thank you. Thank you.